rather seedy he was, but very quiet and unassuming, almost diffident, indeed. He was so gentle and his manners were so pleasing and kindly, whether he was sober or intoxicated, that he made friends of all who came in contact with him. He applied for literary work, offered conclusive evidence that he wielded an easy and practiced pen. And so Mr. F. engaged him at once to help write the novel. His chapter was to follow Mr. D.'s, and mine was to come next. Now what does this fellow do but go off and get drunk, and then proceed to his quarters and set to work with his imagination in a state of chaos? And that chaos in a condition of extravagant activity. <laughs> uh, actually, that's extravagant activity. The result may be guessed. He scanned the chapters of his predecessors, found plenty of heroes and heroines already created, and was satisfied with them. He decided to introduce no more with all the confidence that whiskey inspires and all the easy complacency it gives to its servant. He then launched himself lovingly into his work. He married the coachman to the society young lady for the sake of the scandal, married the duke to the blonde stepmother for the sake of the sensation, stopped the desperado's salary, created a misunderstanding between the devil and the Rosicrucian, threw the duke's property into the wicked lawyer's hands, made the lawyer's upbraiding conscience drive him to drink, thence to delirium tremens, thence to suicide, broke the coachman's neck, let his widow succumb to contumely neglect, poverty and consumption, caused the blonde to drown herself, leaving her clothes on the bank with the customary note pinned to them, forgiving the duke and hoping he would be happy. Revealed to the duke, by means of the usual strawberry mark on left arm, that he had married his own long-lost mother and destroyed his long-lost sister, instituted the proper and necessary suicide of the duke and the duchess in order to compass poetical justice, Open the earth and let the Rosicrucian through, accompanied with the accustomed smoke and thunder and smell of brimstone, and finished with the promise that in the next chapter, after holding a general inquest, he would take up the surviving character of the novel and tell what became of the devil. It read with singular smoothness and with a dead earnestness that was funny enough to suffocate a body. But there was war when it came in. The other novelists were furious. The mild stranger, not yet more than half sober, stood there under a scathing fire of vituperation, meek and bewildered, looking from one to another of his assailants and wondering what he could have done to invoke such a storm. When a lull came at last, he said his say gently and appealingly, said he did not rightly remember what he had written but was sure he had tried to do the best he could, and knew his object had been to make the novel not only pleasant and plausible, but instructive, and the bombardment began again. The novelists assailed his ill-chosen adjectives and demolished them with a storm of denunciation and ridicule. And so the siege went on. Every time the stranger tried to appease the enemy, he only made matters worse. Finally, he offered to rewrite the chapter. This arrested hostilities. The indignation gradually quieted down. Peace reigned again, and the sufferer retired in safety and got him to his own citadel. But on the way thither, the evil angel tempted him, and he got drunk again. And again, his imagination went mad. He led the heroes and heroines a wilder dance than ever, and yet all through it ran that same convincing air of honesty and earnestness that had marked his first work. He got the characters into the most extraordinary situations, put them through the most surprising performances, and made them talk the strangest talk. But the chapter cannot be described. It was symmetrically crazy. It was artistically absurd, and it had explanatory footnotes that were fully as curious as the text. I remember one of the situations and will offer it as an example of the whole. He altered the character of the brilliant lawyer and made him a great-hearted, splendid fellow, 
gave him fame and riches, and set his age at thirty-three years. Then he made the blonde discover, through the help of the Rosicrucian and the melodramatic miscreant, that while the Duke loved her money ardently and wanted it, he secretly felt a sort of leaning toward the society young lady. Stung to the quick, she tore her affections from him and bestowed them with tenfold power upon the lawyer, who responded with consuming zeal. But the parents would none of it. When they want, what they wanted in the family was a duke, and a duke they were determined to have, though they confessed that next to the duke, the lawyer had their preference. Necessarily, the blonde now went into de to a decline. The parents were alarmed. They pleaded with her to marry the duke, but she steadfastly refused and pined on. Then they laid a plan. They told her to wait a year and a day, and if at the end of that time she still felt that she could not marry the duke, she might marry the lawyer with their full consent. Their result was as they had foreseen. Gladness came again, and the flush of returning health. Then the parents took the next step in their scheme. They had the family physician recommend a long sea voyage and much land travel for the thorough restoration of the blonde strength, and they invited the duke to, the, to, to be of the party. They judged that the duke's constant presence and the lawyer's protracted absence would do the rest, for they did not invite the lawyer. So they set sail in a steamer for America, and the third day out, when their seasickness called truce and permitted them to take their first meal at the public table, behold, there sat the lawyer. The duke and party made the best of an awkward situation. The voyage progressed, and the vessel neared America. But by and by, two hundred miles off New Bedford, the ship took fire. She burned to the water's edge. Of all her crew and passengers, only thirty were saved. They floated about the sea half an afternoon and all night long. Among them were our friends. The lawyer, by superhuman exertions, had saved the blonde and her parents, swimming back and forth two hundred yards and bringing one each time, the girl first. The duke had saved himself. In the morning, two whale ships arrived on the scene and sent their boats. The weather was stormy and the embarkation was attended with much confusion and excitement. The lawyer did his duty like a man, helped his exhausted and insensible blonde, her parents and some others into a boat, the duke helped himself in, and a child fell overboard at the other end of the raft, and the lawyer rushed thither and helped half a dozen people fish it out under the stimulus of its mother's screams. Then he ran back. A few seconds too late. The blonde's boat was underway. So he had to take the other boat and go to the other ship. The storm cre increased and drove the vessels out of sight of each other, drove them, drove them whither it would. When it calmed at the end of, the, of three days, the blonde's ship was 700 miles north of Boston and the other about 700 south of that port. The blonde's captain was bound on a whaling cruise in the North Atlantic and could not go back such a distance or make a port without orders such being nautical law. The lawyer's captain was to cruise in the North Pacific, and he could not go back or make a port without orders. All the lawyer's money and baggage were in the blonde's boat and went to the blonde's ship, so his captain made him work his passage as a common sailor. When both ships had been cruising nearly a year, the one was off the coast of Greenland, and the other in Bering Strait. The blonde had long ago been well-nigh persuaded that her lawyer had been washed overboard and lost just before the whale ships reached the raft. And now, under the pleadings of her parents and the duke, she was at last beginning to nerve herself for the doom of the covenant and prepare for the hated marriage. But she would not yield a day before the date set. The weeks dragged on, the time narrowed. Orders were given to deck the ship for the wedding. A wedding at sea among icebergs and walruses. <laughs> Five days more and all would be over. So the blonde reflected with a sigh and a tear. Oh, where was her true love? And why, why did he not come and save her? At that moment, he was lifting his harpoon to strike a whale in Bering Strait, 5,000 miles away by the way of the Arctic Ocean, 
or 20,000 by the way of the horn. That was the reason. He struck, but not with perfect aim. His foot slipped, and he fell in the whale's mouth and went down his throat. He was insensible five days. Then he came to himself and heard voices. Daylight was streaming through a hole cut in the whale's roof. He climbed out and astonished the sailors who were hoisting blubber up a ship's side. He recognized the vessel, flew aboard, surprised the wedding party at the altar, and exclaimed, Stop the proceedings! I'm here! Come to my arms, my own! There were footnotes to this extravagant piece of literature wherein the author endeavored to show that the whole thing was within the possibilities. He said he got the incident of 